chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode is brought to you by Every Plate. You know the great taste of meal kits, but with Every Plate, you get flavor and value. At 50% less than most fast casual dining, Every Plate has great flavors and great prices. And right now, with our special code, you can get meals for $1.49 each and sign up to get a 10-ounce steak for just $1 more added to your weekly order. Get a meal for $1.49 plus $1 steaks for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49DARK. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 steaks. Remember, that's everyplate.com, code 49DARK, to get $1.49 meals and the $1 steak for life. This episode is brought to you by Fume. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfume.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 14, Episode 7. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing three tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Dale Thompson, Kyle Harrison, and Seth Paul. Tonight we'll hear stories of insatiable infections, Flights of Fear and Problematic Positivity. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail, so lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> ha How well do you really know somebody? Really? What's to say that friend of yours for years looks perfectly normal, but as soon as you spend more than three minutes alone with him, Suddenly they've got fangs, have put on a few hundred pounds of extra muscle, and are looking at you like you're a pastrami sandwich. Well, tonight we're dealing with things that lurk beneath the skin, 
waiting to be unleashed. In this tale from Dale Thompson, we meet a runner named Mark, whose joie de vivre is doing a nice bit of running. Unfortunately, he's about to have an encounter that's sure to show some, well, interesting results. Without further ado, I present to you, Werewolf, Their Wolf. Mark was an avid jogger. There was nothing he enjoyed more than going through his ritualistic stretching exercises and in his running suit, which clung to his body, his athletic body, like a glove. With the potency of a sportsman, he would take his run. It was ineffably an exhilaration for him, invigorating to put his feet on the trail and go for it. He primarily ran the same trail every day. This would assure him a great run, eschewing any of the pitfalls of the lesser trails, which he purposely avoided. He'd heard rumors about some of the other pathways, that they were simply far too dangerous to run due to steep precipices, sharp cliff faces with unsteady rock, uneven terrain with unmanaged potholes, even dangerous animals on the track, such as bears, wolves, and moose, were common. The place where he chose to run did not have any of these dangers, and he never felt as though he was running on the cusp of indeterminate declivity or teetering on the edge of bottomless ravines. He had no interest in exploring the chasms of the unknown, nor putting himself in perilous situations unnecessarily. He'd known a couple of runners who had met with tragedy due to the elements. He was not about to fall victim to some sort of testosterone-fueled challenge. He ran for enjoyment, not necessarily for his health. He knew the benefits of raising the heart rate during exercises, but Mark honestly didn't correlate what he did with being physically fit. He regarded it as a meditative event that kept his mind purposed, a type of therapy, with the intent of wellness, of thought, and mental sustainability. Regardless of the weather, Mark was never complacent and, with due diligence, committed to his run. Well hydrated and geared up, Mark set out on his one-hour run. He enjoyed running in the evenings as the day was cooling, and by the time he had made his traverse, he was facing the sunset, which he truly loved to see. This day began unremarkably, and nothing even now appeared out of the ordinary. He'd already covered two-thirds of the track and was coming out of the verdant canopy of trees when something outlandish and extraordinary presented itself. Mark was stopped cold in his tracks his resplendent evening, getting a rude awakening. He simply couldn't continue, and he looked for a quiet, unostentatious way of avoiding what he saw before him blocking the trail. As he stared at the alpha male wolf, who was clearly unwell. He shuddered with a sense of dread that one experiences only a couple of times in life. This comparison of healthy and sickly was made in Mark's mind by recalling nature programs he'd seen in the past on wolves and their behavior. Wolves ran in packs, but this was a lone wolf. Wolves are supposed to fear man, but this one's posture was that of dominance. This was an imposing situation that Mark had never found himself in. Well, ever. The wolf was a magnificent beast. It was a dark color with keen eyes that stared directly into Mark's fearful gaze. It was reputed that wolves feared humans, but this forbidding beast showed no signs of drawing back. It had never occurred to Mark that any dangerous animals would be on this favorite trail of his, so he had made no preparations for such an occurrence, nor was he very good at improvising. He had no weapon, no bear spray, not even a pocket knife. Before Mark could gather his thoughts and collect his courage from the nethermost area of his mind, the wild beast charged Mark in such an unimaginable way, with such ferocity and quickness. Mark had no time to think, to turn, to run, or have a chance to defend himself. The fight was all wolf, at least, until the point at which Mark swore it unnaturally raised upon its hind legs like a man. In this unusual lycanthrope stance, 
The jaws of the mighty savage chomped down into Mark's arm, and its canine teeth, like daggers, pierced his skin to the bone. The weight of the wolf and its momentum had driven Mark to the ground, and there ensued a brief wrestling match, with Mark attempting to protect his face and guard against further injury. The wolf didn't continue the attack and fled, leaving Mark wounded and bleeding. With a beating heart that seemed to want to either leap from his throat or tear free from his pounding chest, Mark staggered along trying to reconcile what had just happened to him. He knew he was in shock and desperately wanted to make it home before the shock wore off because he feared the real pain had not come upon him yet. In his presence of mind, he removed his shirt, wrapped it around his bloody arm, and, without delay, worked his way home. By the time he made it to his door, he was dizzy and somewhat lightheaded. He went straight to the kitchen sink and ran water over the penetrating bite marks. Although it stung with a considerable sharpness, he was most thankful that the thing had not ripped his arm off. Why he didn't go straight to the hospital, even he didn't know, but he opted to treat the wound himself with peroxide and antiseptic cream. He made the conscious decision to stay home from work to allow his arm to heal. On the third day of self-treatment for the bite, he felt a tingling, like a prickling sensation around the bite area, and it itched something terrible. He'd become restless and felt like climbing out of his own body. He knew he had the flu. He, He just knew it. But then again, as he relived the attack in his mind... His thoughts stirred with a real worry. The wolf stood upright to attack him. This was a strange, unordinary way for any wolf to go after prey. And then the unimagined crossed his mind. Maybe this was no ordinary wolf at all. As inconceivable as it sounded when he repeated it, he, in fact, did repeat the word werewolf from his lips several times. He considered the indescribable event, and he couldn't imagine what else could possibly be. It was unfathomable, he reminded himself, yet he believed he could sense a change in his body. He had a headache that was persistent, but not throbbing. A fever, but he wasn't burning up. Nauseous, but he had not thrown up, and seemingly he was more agitated than usual. He no longer had a vague suspicion. He convinced himself that this was no flu. He'd been attacked by a werewolf, and now he was changing into such a beast. Mark was running over the brim with anxiety and worry. He didn't know how being a werewolf would affect his life, his work, or even hanging out with the few friends that he did have. How would they feel if they knew the truth of the matter? He had to keep this a secret from the whole world, to be inflexible and obdurate, and trust no one. He knew there was no reversal of such a chemical alteration and transformation to his DNA, so he secured his reluctance and was inclined to accept what was happening to him. He was in uncharted waters now, the sepulchral depths over his head. The unknown was before him, and he wanted to face it unperturbed if at all possible. After a few days, he wrestled with insomnia and refused to sleep because he wanted to be aware of the change when it came. He checked his teeth daily to see if there were any noticeable signs that his canine teeth were becoming longer. He didn't see anything out of the ordinary, but again, this was new to him, an indiscernible mystery. He stuck out his tongue in order to see if it had grown in length. It had not. He examined his body supposing that he'd begin to grow hair in unusual places in the antigen phase, but didn't see any signs of new follicles. Possibly it was a progressive disease. He was now calling it a disease. He thought transmutation would only take hours, but now he was going into days and the metamorphosis seemed to be a much slower growth than what he had anticipated. Mark finally left his house to pick up some things from the store. He didn't like the thought of canine sustenance, but he figured if he were going to be a werewolf, he possibly needed dog food for sustainability. He didn't want to kill humans. He struggled with the thought. But what if he wasn't a proper werewolf and more like a mutt, a mongrel, or a cur dog? He hadn't been bitten by relatives, so he had no real pedigree. 
He feared he might not be a complete werewolf and he might become a hound, a mixed breed with purebred ancestry. Would this mean he wouldn't be accepted by other werewolves? Essentially, if this were the case, he might be doomed, having to hide and shelter among others damned by the same malady. He also fantasized what it could be, considering that he was the lone wolf without a pack who would search for a mate, and together they would be the key to the genetic survival of the species. A lone wolf is the strongest wolf because it hunts for itself and is hardened by the time and solitude. Once home, he had the sensation that he needed to chew on something. He was positive that if he accelerated the process along, hurry it, so to speak, he'd change much quicker. If he acted like an animal while the fluids in his body transformed into the DNA of a wolf, in all certainty, he was confident it would progress things along at a more expedited rate. Thankfully, when he purchased the bag of dry dog food, he bought a rubber bone just in case this sort of thing happened. Mark gnawed on this dog toy while salivating profusely. He practiced growling, and it was during this lunacy that he had an idea. Maybe the conversion into a full-blown werewolf needed to happen under the light of a full moon. Ignoring sensibilities and all practicalities, he resorted to checking his calendar in the kitchen and easily noted that the next full moon would be tomorrow night. He was thrilled that it could be that soon. At that moment, he hadn't slept at all and was feeling decrepit. His muscles ached, and he assumed that as his human form was changing, he would find it a painful, maybe agonizing, miserable process. Mark prepared a bowl of dog food to eat and sat at the kitchen table. He convinced himself he needed to start living like a werewolf because the more he practiced the mannerisms, the more practical the character of the wolf inside would reveal itself. In order for the indecipherable change to occur, he understood that his central nervous system would be readily affected and that he might even begin to think of as a wolf thinks. Those were his thoughts as he popped individual bits of dog food into his mouth and forced hard swallows. He didn't know if it was the dryness of the food itself, the thought of actually eating dog food, or if his throat was swollen, but he was having difficulty swallowing. Against his better judgment, he retrieved a bottle of whiskey from the cabinet along with a glass of water. Mark drank the glass of water and then, in an attempt to knock himself out so he could rest for tomorrow's big manifestation when he would become a full-fledged werewolf, he nursed the bottle for the next couple of hours, knocking it back until he was inexorably as drunk as a skunk. If the symptoms of changing into a nocturnal creature of the night were not already challenging, Mark was not a good person while intoxicated, nor was he an exemplary human being. For reasons unknown even to Mark, instead of trying to sleep, he decided he needed to go hunting. He walked outside into the evening air, and his inebriated self sniffed the air, hoping his canine sense of smell had developed. But he was unable to pick up those smells that he knew a dog must have. They were indistinct. Staggering along, lost in fascination, uncertain of his destiny, he walked the stony path insatiably smitten with the idea of biting someone. As outrageous as it sounded, he persuaded himself that practice made perfect. His unassailable conclusion was that he believed he was turning into a werewolf, but that he would retain his human qualities. These were ontologically distinct from one another, meaning he might be in conflict with himself according to which aspect was more dominant. He spotted a woman walking alone. He said to himself, easy target. He used no prestidigitation, no sleight of hand or tricks, nor did he use camouflage or concealment. Committing a purely rookie mistake, he mindlessly charged the woman, mouth open, growling pathetically and lunged at her. She was carrying an umbrella, which she had failed to determine, before the unwitting assault. She whacked him several times across the top of the head, using both hands masterfully to repel the would-be debutante werewolf, and fending off the assault. Pummeling Mark without hesitation, 
causing him to scamper away with his tail between his legs, so to speak. His own carnal actions and behavior repulsed him. Sitting in a furtive area of the woods, he knew he had done the most foolish thing he could have done. The woman would have seen his face, would have been able to describe him in every detail. He needed to make his way back home. He decided to pass through the forest for the cover, running along the backs of other houses that faced the main highway. The vegetation was dense, but he was well hidden from sight. Distinctly, he heard the sound of chickens. Insatiably, he felt a vestigial flicker, and his appetite wettened again. The urge to feed was upon him, smothering his intellect, which aroused the instinctual qualities of the beast he saw within. He followed the clucking until he spotted the henhouse. Stealthily, he moved with the twilight of the evening closer and closer until he reached the fenced-in area. He probed his teeth with his finger, but he had not grown longer canine teeth yet. Disappointed, he lamented impotently, but he was not dissuaded. He opened the unlocked gate to the chickens and sneaked inside. His plan was to snatch a hen, wring her neck, and smother the fowl, then chow down. When he entered the coop, the chickens were nesting idly. Completely out of character and positively unethically, he grabbed hold of the first hen with both hands. There was an infusion of mayhem and incomprehensible chaos ensued, which seemed like an interminable duration of time, but in reality was only a few short seconds. Every chicken in the coop, sensing a predator and that danger was in their midst, took to flight, flapping their wings, cackling loudly, and pecking away at Mark, who let loose the hen he had momentarily seized. The only thing now for him to do was to retreat and free himself from the confined space, which he did expediently. With chicken feathers matted to his hair, he had no choice but to take to the woods again. He had to be clandestine, because... By now, surely the woman had reported the attack, and the chicken farmer may have seen him sprinting for cover. Without detouring, he made it home in one piece. He was traumatized by the fowl attack, because he never knew chickens would and could fight back. He dismissed this as an amateur move on his part, and told himself that he would learn to be a fantastic werewolf over time. Besides, tomorrow was the full moon and it would be then he would reveal his ultimate potential. Still, with fever and a sickening headache, he somehow managed to sleep, and in his dreams he was seen reveling in unholy celebration with others likened to himself. In grand extravagance he was the master of ceremonies at this appointed time, and he found effectual comfort in knowing he'd been readily accepted as one of them. When he finally awoke, he was, as they say, sicker than a dog. He was now burning hot to the touch with fever, and his muscles were seizing up. The uninterrupted dream had given him hope, but he was disturbed by the enhanced symptoms. Quickly, he forced down a handful of dog food, which he ate from a bowl, on all fours while on the kitchen floor. He lapped water from the second bowl, but had an impossible time swallowing. He was convinced that these severe flu-like symptoms were all part of his changeover into a wild, untamed beast. He told himself it was imperative to make it to the trail this evening, and there he could relinquish his identification as human, as a mere man, and embrace this moment of imputation he now longed for. His soul would experience the consummation with the animal mutating within, and without portent he would humbly allow himself to become that which all men fear. He repeated these things in his head and hoped for an acceleration of the process. His human side was dying, for sure, and he needed the wolf to be fully, maturely born. He wanted desperately to see through the eyes of the wolf, to hear the sounds amplified and defined, he wanted to unmute the sense of smell and to inhale and breathe through powerful lungs, to discern the scents and identify recognized odors of the world in a supernatural way. He wondered if he'd remember himself as a human after the complete transformation had occurred. He was compelled by a feeling of sorrow that he may not remember the past. However, it would be a new life, a new way of adventure that he had never known before. 
As the sun was setting and the day was expiring, Mark tenuously proceeded to the running track, which would take him far into the forest. By this time, he was gaunt, feeble, emaciated, and his face shriveled and ghostly pallid with a frozen, sallow expression. He smelled a putrescent dissolve, like something which had crawled from an immemorial burial site and needed immediate fumigation and cleansing. But that had to wait. He wondered if the final change would hurt. He imagined that it would. He self-proclaimed himself as a visionary and saw himself grotesquely contorted, broken, bones protruding while shape-shifting, thrashing about and uncontrolled convulsions, raising the wolf from dormancy while his bones exploded into stronger, more durable ones. His joints surely would be unimaginably aching as they swelled to fit the new and improved body. His skin, the largest organ of the body, would rip and tear, then peel away, and he would emerge a terror for all to see. This new life would be the validity he foresaw in his dreams. He no longer would have to scrutinize his existence, for he would know exactly what he was. He was willing to be dissolved or absorbed so that he would gain the sight that the wolf had, that fiery dilation of eyes that he saw days ago. He longed for the instinctual fortitude and the erudition of the beast undisturbed. When he made it to the spot where he had been bitten, which was on a very high plateau, he saw the moon was full and nearly at its lunar zenith. His thoughts were scrambled and he ponderously swore, while in a haze of confusion, that he saw the same wolf that had bitten him. But in peevish discontent, his eyes were blurred, and he staggered and swayed carelessly, invoking the unnamed spirit of the wolf. Come forth from me, appear! Mark reached out his hands toward the moon. I am the species, the canis of a new morning. He felt the abruptness of the wind and believed it was answering him. Mark howled vigorously and it unfolded poorly, like a desperate plea to be put down. He howled again, pathetically, then gasped for breath. He went down on his knees and held his head in his hands. He prayed that his cranium would swell, expand to receive the wolf inside. Dyspeptically, he fell to one side, moaning and groaning in agonizing pain. Guttural calls to his kin rumbled from what life was left in him. He gave a derisory whimper and began to whine like a nervous dog, whose owner left and had never returned. Now he prayed for the silver bullet to the heart to erase his suffering, to make it all go away. Lycanthropy never occurred. Mark never did become a beta wolf, for he had never been bitten by a werewolf. He was bitten, bitten by a rabbit wolf with full-blown rabies. Under the brightness of the full moon, Mark's howling and pleas for transformation ceased. This furious episode had ended, first with Mark's partial paralysis overwhelming him, causing him to crumble under his own weight. Then hallucinations laid siege to and conquered his reality. Mark cradled his knees to his chest in the fatal position, without remedy for the rabies he had endured in obscurity, alone in dreary discourse with himself, convinced until the end that he would howl once more. This episode's brought to you by Every Plate. Meal plans are a great way to get fresh food delivered to your door and along with it, a delicious, healthful meal. Even better are ones that fit your budget. That's why I recommend Every Plate. From a selection of 26 recipes that change weekly, you can select dinners that can please everyone in your home, keep money in your pocket for the holiday season, with prices 50% lower than eating fast, casual dining, and are made properly portioned so you can spend less time prepping and cleaning and more time enjoying the season. And now, be sure to take advantage of this great deal. With our special code, you can sign up and get meals for $1.49 a plate, but you can also enjoy a 10-ounce ranch steak with your weekly order for just a dollar additional to your order. 
And as long as your subscription's active, you can continue to add the $1 steak for life to your order each week. I can't imagine a deal any better than this, or the quality of food for the price. Get a meal for $1.49 plus $1 steaks for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49DART. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 steaks. Remember, that's everyplate.com code 49DART to get your $1.49 meal and the $1 steaks for life. Thanks to Every Plate for sponsoring this podcast and to you for supporting our sponsor. I hope you enjoyed Werewolf, Their Wolf by Dale Thompson, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash dale dash thompson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash d-a-l-e dash T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. He's here, and he's got plenty of stories for you to enjoy. And you can always give him a holler at his official YouTube channel. And he's got more for you in store in episodes to come. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Poor Mark. Guess he'll think about going to a doctor next time, huh? Oh, right. There is no next time for him. Rabies is nothing to sneeze at. Eating dog food for fun, though? Well, that's another can of worms. Kyle Harrison has an interesting one for you. Here we have a family on the run, hunted because they just don't fit in the world. But it's not the destination. It's the journey that's the problem. Without further ado, I present to you Tears of the Moon Children. My father spent his final months teaching me about hope and having faith in humanity. It resulted in him dead in a ditch and my life changing forever. He was a dreamer, my dad, and the one thing he loved to dream about the most was a better life. We were poor. The house we had in the old country was hardly enough for my sister, brother, and me to consider a home. The roof leaked, the walls were thin, and the windows were broken. Mother would say that we must focus on what we can change, rather than what we cannot. Both of them had accepted their fate long ago, I think, before we were ever born. Children often inherit from their parents gifts, talents that can be passed down, from generation to generation. Our family could only impart a curse, one so terrible and cruel that it left us being treated as monsters by those who knew and believed that we were outcasts, by those who did not. Our secret, you see, is that we were afflicted with lycanthropy. Uncle Andreas called it the moon disease. He said that long ago, when our people were very young and the world was still new, one of our great-grandfathers had made love to a lady that lived in the moon. Uncle Andreas claimed that the moon goddess was a married woman and that her husband, the vile sun god Narsh, discovered her treachery and commanded that all who had ever slept with her would be afflicted and treated as beasts. As a result... We now turn into creatures of legend when the moon rises fully in the sky. Yes, my family are werewolves. This curse is something we've dealt with since birth, since I, before I was born. And chances are we still will deal with it long after I'm gone. The worst part is that we cannot predict when it'll happen. The change, I mean. The initial transformation would occur any time after a child passes the age of eight. For my sister, Lupita, she was unlucky enough to experience her change at nine. That was when our whole world changed. Dad had been a farmer trying to earn a modest living here in the country for most of his life. 
The reason he chose such simple work was twofold. It kept eyes off of us, and it helped him to be able to take time off when he could feel the curse was about to afflict his body. Dad was almost 40, and he often said that because he had felt the curse so much in his life, it was easier for him to be prepared now. When the time came, him and Ma and Andreas, well, they made sure we had the money and food we needed for that night, and then headed to our small storm shelter. We managed to get a few friends in a nearby village that knew a thing or two about basement construction to build it, although they did give us odd looks at first. Dad greased their palms with money to keep their mouths shut when he made special requests that outfitted the shelter with what looked like torture equipment. I'm sure the construct workers likely thought my parents were just into some kinky stuff, and honestly, I'd done my best to spread the rumor when I went to school. Kids teased me when they heard my parents had a sex dungeon, but it kept them from knowing the truth. They changed themselves in there for the night whenever it came their turn. The other two adults, who didn't have the transformation, stood watch to keep the shelter safe. They explained all this to me when I was turning eight. They even made sure I watched so I knew exactly what the curse did to our bodies. My parents' bones would crack their spines, becoming elongated. Their bodies rippled, skin tingling, their hands webbing together and their hair becoming mangled and thick. It was slow, and it was painful. And when it was all done, and their new fearsome form wrestled with the chains trying to kill me, I knew they spoke the truth that the curse could not be controlled. There will be a time it'll happen to you as well, Gustavo. And this is why we must make certain you understand how frightening it is, because we could harm each other or harm our neighbors. The village must never know because they would fear us and cast us out, Ma told me. I went to bed every night after that, dreading when the transformation would take hold of me. I was fourteen when it did. Uncle Andreas and I were out gathering berries for a birthday for a family member when I felt like my heart would explode. I told Uncle it was also feeling like fire was going through my body. Immediately he knew what was happening. He helped me up and looked around the field, realizing that the sun was setting, and shouted for help. We were deep in the woods. There was a chance I could change and then wreak havoc on him and anyone else nearby. I would be a monster in only a matter of minutes. Uncle acted quickly, dragging me toward a nearby trash pit, where he would often discard our unwanted items and burn them. It was a favorite spot for late summer nights. But that night, it acted as my prison. I don't recall much, except I knew that he forced me into the hole. I was already delirious, my body changing before my eyes. My voice lost control of itself as I was hurled into the hole, and I heard a howl leap from my lips. I blacked out not longer after that, but Andreas told me that my change was one of the most violent and brutal he ever saw. When I woke, I was naked in the pit, covered with scars. Uncle told me that I had attacked myself and tried to climb to kill him. He had a gun on him at all times. With tears in his eyes, he admitted he didn't know what would happen if I had climbed out. I told myself I would stop you, but would I have found the strength to do so? Would it have even mattered, he whispered, his palms shaking. After that incident, he didn't come around for about a year. My parents made preparations for me to be chained when the moon curse hit, and I worked hard to make sure Lupita was safe from harm since I had to watch them when they were trapped there. I don't want to be a monster. Why can't we just live somewhere where we are accepted? She asked Ma one day. But no one knew of such a miraculous place. Not until Andreas returned. It was shortly after Lupita had experienced the curse for the first time herself, Less than a day, in fact. She was having a sleepover at a friend's house, and unfortunately for them, the transformation hit, and she killed them all. I remember being dressed for school the next day and finding her wandering the road, bloody and delirious and barefoot. She had no clue what she had done, but word had spread fast. 
I took her hand when I realized the terror she had inflicted and ran straight home. That night our house was burned down. Dad learned of what had happened, and we tried to think of a plan for what would come next. But the people in the village already knew what they were going to do. Just as Dad has always predicted, they attacked us. Lupita was sheltered by Ma as we found a way to escape the house, running to our small car and driving it as they burned it like we were just scum. As I saw the smoke rise and our home torn apart, I wondered if perhaps we were meant to suffer forever. I know a place where we can lay low for a while, Dad said. It was a shelter, small and cramped and moldy. We had only the clothes on our back, and Lapita was still struggling to control her own emotions as we entered, making all eyes on us. We cannot stay here long. Those people who chased us will find us again, and they won't stop until we're dead, Ma said. Dad knew she spoke the truth, and I knew what she was implying. We would have to leave. But where would we go? And how would we even know if we were safe wherever we went? There were so many uncertainties, and I knew that the reality was we probably couldn't ever feel safe as long as this curse afflicted us. Without our home and our storm chamber, the next time the moon curse hit, nothing would be available to lock us away. We would be killers again and again, and someone would stop us. We deserved to be stopped. I thought to myself bitterly that night as I watched my sister shiver. She would live the rest of her days knowing the friend she cherished as a child died at her hand. Would she even be able to live with herself? And what if I committed such a crime? Were we victims or monsters? Such thoughts kept me up until dawn as I dreaded whatever nightmares might race across my mind. This episode is brought to you by Fume. Ever try to stop a habit cold turkey? Well, just so you know, it's a tough process, and for many, it's not the most effective method of making that habit gone for good. Perhaps that's because there are habits that aren't bad, that get given up in the process, and those little things get missed along the way. But why give up those? Why throw out the bad with the good? Instead of going cold turkey, try a breath of fresh air with Fume. Fume's designed to help you avoid what's bad and keep what's good. It's an air device, handsome, well-balanced, easy to hold and play around with. All you have to do is load in a canister of flavored air. No vapors, no electronics, and breathe. I think you'll love the light herbal tea-like taste of items like sparkling grapefruit, orange vanilla, just like I do, and many more delightful flavors that will keep you relaxed, happy, and make stopping fun. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfume.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. In the morning, just when I thought I might sleep, I heard talking near my cot. Uncle Andreas had found us. At first, I thought of jumping up to greet him, but Daw sounded angry. They were arguing as quietly as they could, but I heard it all. Show your face after all this time? You're not our family any longer, little brother, Dad told him. There was a reason for why I left. When I saw what happened with Gustavo, I told myself I don't want to face the same thing ever again. I couldn't kill my nephew, nor should I be forced to. I promised myself that I could find a way for all of us to live without this fear. Andreas answered back, You speak of nonsense, fairy tales. Perhaps it is only a dream, but I saw it with my own eyes, brother. A safe haven far to the north, and I know a way to get there. I heard Lupita next. She had overheard them fighting and asked if it was her fault. Dad did his best to comfort her. 
And then he saw I was awake, too. Gustavo, I see that look in your eyes. You think chasing this dream would be our only escape, don't you? You told me that we must always do whatever we can for each other. As long as we're together, we can accomplish anything, I said. He smiled softly. You're becoming a wise young man, my son. You're right. We must look toward a new horizon. He told his brother that we would try to live together. Andreas explained where we would need to go. A train yard, he said, on the outskirts of a city about a half hour from here would be the place we would hop onto a train to take us deep into the North Mountains. Ma was more than eager, thinking of our safety. I see the people here watching us. They know what we are. We cannot sleep here another night, she warned Dodd. We gathered our things and made for the car, only to see that someone had slashed the tires. Andrea said the train leaves in 48 hours. Taking a public bus will be dangerous now. We must go on foot, Dodd said watching the crowd suspiciously. I'm scared, my sister said as we headed toward the nearest trail. It was already getting late. Stay close to me, Lapita. We're going to be okay, I told her. But I was scared too. There was a chill in the air, and even though there were woods around us, I was certain we were being followed. We have to go straight till we reach the train yard. No time for breaks, Ma told us as we stopped at the stream for water. Then we heard noises off in the distance. Dogs were being sent into the woods. None of us second-guessed what they were hunting. We were prey now. Stay together, head up this hill. Dad ordered as we used the stream to hide our scent. Every minute counted as we raced and zigzagged through the woods. It felt like we couldn't even stop to catch our breath. Dad kept shouting for us to run, not to look back. The barking grew closer. Lupita let out a scream as her ankle twisted and she fell down a slope. I turned to help her, but Ma told me to keep going. I will carry her. Then a bullet ripped past her head, and I screamed as I saw hunters in the tree lines. They were close to us. Ma held Lupita close, and Da uh, told us to head toward a series of caverns. Inside the darkness was a welcome distraction as we pushed past stones and moss. It was a narrow crawl space, and he told me to head inside. No, not without you, I insisted. He gave me a stern look and shoved me down on my palms. Keep your sister's eyes closed. She cannot see this. The men were at the mouth of the cave. I took Lupita from Ma and held her tight as I saw my parents turn toward the men. Their bodies trembled suddenly and shook. But I knew what was happening. They were transforming. In a matter of seconds, they were twice their normal body weight and snarling as massive wolves. Their howls rocked the cave as they began to pounce on the men. I watched, covering Lupita's eyes as my parents made mincemeat of the hunters. It was over in minutes, the cave a bloody mess of body parts, and my parents began reverting back to their human forms. They were exhausted and collapsed at the mouth of the cave. I was angry, shocked, and still frightened. There were others out in the woods. I took one of the guns that the hunters had carried and guarded the door, protecting my family all night as I listened to every sound, every whisper. Somehow we made it through that night. In the morning, my parents woke, sore and ashamed of what they had done. They immediately began the trek through the woods in silence. Dad, why didn't you ever tell me we could transform instantly? I thought it was a curse from the moon, I told him. He smiled, looking sad as we crossed another stream. You're not a child anymore, Gustavo. That story was for children. Our culture calls us moon children, but the curse, it's in our blood. Well, what does that mean, I asked. There's magic in this world, things beyond our understanding. Things and beings that easily overpower us, even. You've heard of stories, yes? Of creatures besides us? Damn fear and fay? All such things exist. They, too, hate us, for they envy our strength. We're in tune with the magic it runs through our blood. True, at your age, it's beyond control. But as you grow and learn, the moon holds no sway over you any longer. But then why do we simply not fight? Overpower the others. We could do so much, I told him. It's true, we could have the power. 
but at what cost? Some parts of the legend are true. The more we change, the more we lose our human selves. Eventually, the beast takes over, and all we wish for is a normal life. He trailed off as we broke from the woods and found the train yard. It was empty and foggy, almost ethereal. Andreas was there along with a few strangers I didn't know. They guided us deeper into the train yard and pointed toward an empty stock car. Climb in, little brother. We're on our way to a ticket of a better life, Andreas told my dad. All of us piled in and I actually took a moment to relax. I didn't fully understand why my parents were against using the powers we had to make us have a better life, but I wanted to try to. Violence, Dodd said, was never the answer to happiness. We rested there, waiting for the train to leave. A gentle rain settled over us. When I did wake, there were noises in the yard. It was dark, but I could see silhouettes and glimming flashlights. The men have returned, Ma said, as they tended to Lapita. We were sitting ducks. Let me handle this. View it as a repayment for having left before. Andreas insisted. He climbed out of the stock car and slid the door closed. All of us huddled together in the dark corner and listened as he transformed and unleashed a hell on the hunters. Screams filled the air. Howls. And then rapid gunfire. The yelps from his mouth echoed in my ears. Then silence. My uncle was dead. Dad motioned for us to remain quiet as we heard the men try to search the yard. They were close. I could smell their fear. We should take the one we killed in. It would be a big reward. One man cackled. It enraged me so much that I nearly transformed. Dad held me back. Think of your sister. We must leave this place for her. Killing those men will accomplish nothing. They view us as monsters, treating us like trophies, I shouted. We must work for a future where that changes. But it cannot happen with blood on your hands, he whispered. Eventually, they left. Then, about an hour later, we heard a train whistle. We were off. I settled and watched as we pulled out of the yard, everything we knew flying by. I wanted so badly to have the same hope my dad did. But the next day of travel hardly instilled that hope. We were far across the border, the train blazing across the frontier, when we heard the sound of train workers coming through the cars to search for vagabonds. Clearly, they were used to normal traffic, and Dad reasoned that we could talk with them. Remain out of sight, he told us. His optimism got him killed. When the men entered the cargo hold and saw him, he didn't get to say a single word. They raised their firearms and shot him. Then he began to transform, and one man frantically pushed the cargo door open. A fight ensued. My monster's father was eager to protect us, but wounded. He didn't stand a chance. The men shot him again and pushed him toward the open door. Despite my best efforts to stay silent, I screamed in anger when I saw Dowd fall into the ditch, his head smashing against a rock. The men turned their guns toward our hiding spot and fired. The bullets hit my skin, but I hardly knew. My muscles were already rippling, my body on fire. I was a rage incarnate. I transformed, but this time I did not black out. This time I relished killing these murderous thugs. Their bullets were meaningless to my anger. My soul wanted retribution, and I got it. I wanted to tear them to ribbons and howl at the night, feasting on their bodies. They were cowering before me. And it gave me a sense of power I never knew I had. Ma rose from her hiding spot, staring down my monstrous wolf form. Gustavo, this is not us. They are not our enemy. They are frightened. Do not become the monster they hate, she begged. I saw their trembling forms and almost ignored her when I heard Lupita crying. She was afraid of me. Her tears softened my heart and I let them run in fear. Slowly, I reverted back to my normal body and collapsed in Ma's arms. She blockaded the door and then soothed me to rest. We all mourned Dodd silence. His bravery would ensure we made it there safely. But would it be worth it? The next dawn gave us our answer. We were deep in the mountains and the train was refueling. 
Uncle had told us this was where we would depart and make for the nearest peak. It was gloomy and foreboding. Our bodies were sore, and our minds were filled with gloom, but we pushed forward. We climbed the mountain and watched the train drive away about an hour later, not turning back. We were in a lost and forgotten place. It was hard to imagine more isolation than this. As we went through the trail, I saw a large manor nestled in the rocks. Could this be the promised land? There were people standing near the entrance grounds. They saw us coming, and for the first time in ages, I saw recognition and compassion. Some rushed to help. Others grabbed our things. I kept my distance and my guard up as they surrounded us, unsure if they could be trusted. But soon they gave us food and water and we were allowed entry to the main gate. The owner, a man who seemingly was more human than any of us there, told us that we would be safe here. We've been through enough, he told Ma as we got rooms. That was some time ago, and it's true, we have found a sense of peace here. The grounds are quiet and we need not fear the curse. Some strange magic seems to protect the grounds. The haven is exactly as we had hoped. It isn't perfect because we lost so much getting here. But I know I see Da smiling down from the moon. He's glad we're safe. For the first time in our lives, I will dare to hope we can have a peaceful existence. We remember what we lost, but we cherish what we have. Our nights can now sleep peacefully... Our dreams no longer filled with screams. And hopefully, the only tears we shed now will be happy ones. I hope you enjoyed Tears of the Moon Children by Kyle Harrison, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured authors can be found by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kyle dash Harrison. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash K-Y-L-E dash H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N. Another of our regulars, he'll be scaring up some more stories for you soon. Stay tuned to the next few episodes to find out. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. And more than that, a thank you to all of tonight's featured authors. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012. All of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just try searching for Otis Gyrie. Until next week, stay spooky. And get some sleep, (laughs) if you can. (laughs) Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.